So welcome everybody to this webinar on how to get started for your college with Piano Marble. Um, there are lots of reasons why universities use this and not everybody uses it for the same reason. So sometimes universities will just use it for sight reading, their sight reading solution. It has everything they need to test their students and to give them content to practice. Um, I've seen universities just use the SASR, Standard Assessment of Sight Reading. They tell the students once or twice a week you need to get in there and take a test um, just to practice your sight reading and so that they can see how well they're, they're doing. The monthly reading challenges, and we do this every month where we have a new challenge for them to just read fun music. It's the best thing you can do to improve reading is just read. Um, some use it for just the sight reading samurai. Some colleges just use it for the scale ninja, which is the coolest way to teach scales and the fastest way. So some sometimes you can get all the scales taught in just one semester just by using the scale ninja. Um, some use it just for automatic grading and customizing reports because they spend way too much time sitting there listening to students play to pass off songs. So this is, it's all automated this way, it saves maybe 50% of their workload. And then fourth, some use it to just upload their own content. And number five, um, allowing students to learn at their own pace, which is really, really big. So that way students aren't getting left behind or they're not feeling like uh, they're bored because they want to move on, but the, other, the rest of the class isn't ready. So Let's go ahead and see really quickly what some students at this university and the teachers think, what they like about using Piano Marble. Hey, my name is Audrey Weber. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm a first year music education student here, uh, focused in the choral track. I really like the instant feedback that it gives you because it'll show you, like when you record it in, it'll show you exactly what notes you get right, what notes you get wrong, um, and it'll give you a score, like percentage-wise, so that's really helpful, especially if I'm focusing so hard on when I'm playing, so that I can see, okay, this is where I missed it, and that's where I need to work on. So the practice mode is really nice because it'll, like, it's not forcing you to keep moving, so you can really take your time and be like, okay, this is the note, and then it will only move on once you get the note correct. So that's really helpful just to learn exactly what fingerings. As a teacher, a few things that you always look for, one is how to maybe track student progress, how to grade student a bit quicker. I think Piano Marble does help a lot with that. We use the learn mode a lot more often, or at least I do when I'm trying to first look at a piece because it splits it up into, um, you can do minced or chopped, so it'll do like, okay, just the right hand, just the left hand, just this set of measures and then it'll keep moving up and then it also does it at three different speeds so you know you get it at the slowest speed and it's like okay great job now you can move on to the next speed and so it slowly warms you up to get to that performance tempo so for student i think one of the things that uh, helps them is uh, it makes them much more independent i think uh, like as a music teacher we uh, like to think that traditional method, you know, sometimes is always better. You you need a personal connection, you know, of those things, verbal uh, instructions, and it's true. A, a lot of the time, you always need that. Uh, but some of these technology, especially with group classes, it does speed things up. It makes our life as a teacher to arrange things, to uh, create things, so much easier. What I wanted to go through is just show you the agenda, what we're going to cover today, um, the things that are probably the most um, concerning for teachers who are just starting off. Um, the ideal lab setup is something that teachers often ask me, like, what kind of lab do I need? What kind of devices could I use or adapters for students? Should they bring their own computers or should they should we have computers at the school so we'll we'll address those concerns and also maybe one of the biggest ones is what cable should i buy because there's a million cables out there and i've tested a ton so i will give you a document that shows you which ones i recommend um customizing your curriculum is a big one some people use the alfred group piano for adults um but they probably 
have chosen to to cross off some of the songs that they don't expect students to use or there's too much content. So they don't want to do all of them. Piano Marvel is perfect for just customizing the ones you want to use, whether it's group piano for adults by uh, Alfred or whether it is your own content you can upload. Um, also, what does day one in class look like? We're going to cover that. And then we're going to cover the cost options. Um, can you get it in the bookstore? Do they get it online? How much does it cost? Is there a, a promotional code for students? Do they get a discount? We'll cover all that. Um, and then if I haven't covered something that you need, then we'll open it to questions at the end. So let's take a look, first of all, at this document. This is a resource that I've created for you. Um, you will find it if you're watching this on YouTube in the description of the video. If you are watching on Zoom right now, you can go into the um, the chat where David has pasted the link to this document. And let me zoom in just a little bit so you can see what we have here. So what I've provided for you today is connecting your piano to your device. Um, it's so much easier than you think it is. So if you just click on this and open this document, you'll see what it starts with, which is a video. And I want to just show you this first video in 30 seconds. How do you connect your lab? Hey, I want to show you in 30 seconds how to set up Piano Marvel. You will need a USB cable and an audio cable. So let's start with the USB. Plug one side into your computer, and then the other side, you'll plug into the back of your piano where it says USB. And then the audio, you will plug into your headphone jack in your computer, and on the back of your piano where it says audio input. Then test it out, see if it works. All you have to do now is plug in your headphones and you're set. And it is that easy, like super, super simple. Um, if you look at that second video in this document, Connecting Your Piano, it goes into a little more depth on what devices and different cables that I recommend. So we'll open this one. How do you know what cable to buy to connect your digital piano to your device so that you can get perfect precision using Piano Marvel? Well, let me show you. You can see today I'm going to show you how to connect your Android tablets, your Android phone, your Windows computer, Chromebook, your MacBook, your iPads or iPhone, and all with just a couple of cables. Make sure to check the description in this video where I recommend cables that I've tested personally and that I recommend. This cable right here has a USB end and that will go into your piano. On the other side of this cable, you can see it has both a USB-C and a USB-A side. So these are great because you can plug into almost any computer. Now, if you have an iPad that's USB-C, that's fine. But what if you have an iPad that's lightning or your phone that takes lightning? What you'll need is an adapter that you plug in the USB-A into the camera part and then plug this into your lightning port. Now that's great if your piano has a USB-B port, but what if your piano is so old it only has MIDI in and MIDI out? Then I recommend this cable. Unless your piano has a USB micro, then I recommend this cable with this adapter. For the next part, it looks like it's time to find out what your piano has. You might want a flashlight for this part. Let's go check it out. Sometimes it's really hard to find the port. Here it is, MIDI in and MIDI out. Oh, but this piano, look at this, what I found. There is a USB-B port. This one only has a MIDI in and MIDI out. It only has a USB micro. This one's my favorite, it's so easy to see. USB, easy. It's time to buy your cable. Go to the description in the video, open up this link, and if you found that you have a USB-B port on your piano, 
click on this link and buy your cable today. If you found that you have a MIDI in and MIDI out port, click on this link and buy your cable. Don't forget, if you're trying to connect to an iPad that uses lightning or an iPhone, make sure to get your camera adapter. And if you have a USB micro on your piano, click this link. And don't forget, if you need an adapter, make sure to buy it now. All right, so really quickly, um, I've had a lot of universities say, well, our students can't afford their own computer. Should should we really be requiring them to bring their own computer or should we have our own computer set up? And I have seen lots of universities do it differently. Some have their own computers. They set it up for the students. If you do that, it's important to make sure that the computer is right in front of where they would be reading music. Don't make them look to the side and try to read like this because it's not ergonomically, it's not going to be good for them. Um, you can always use that computer right in front of them and put the sheet music in front. However, it's recently I've seen more of a trend where universities just ask their students to bring their laptop. After COVID, almost every student will have a laptop. And if for some reason they don't, the library will usually allow them to loan one or borrow one so they can use it in your class. Um Every university that I've seen do that has not had a problem with students bringing their own device. One benefit to that is the university has no cost in obtain, uh, updating and maintaining the computer. Um, if they had to download or install anything, they, you don't have to worry about it because the students have access to doing that. And you don't have to go to the, the IT department for any upgrades. It solves a big problem for you if you can have the students bring their own laptops. Um, they can use an iPad, a Chromebook, or a laptop, Mac or Windows. Um, we are also making Piano Marble will be available very soon for um, Android as well. So you can use an iPhone, which is small, but I've been using the phone and believe it or not, it actually works better than you think. If you haven't tried it, just um, you know, download the the Piano Marvel app on your iPhone and try it. Um, what other questions do universities have? Um, what cables to buy? I would follow that link. I use Amazon, so everything that I've tested, I've tested it on every device I could think of, every piano I could think of. The one thing that is a little bit difficult is the audio. So if you are trying to get your audio set up, let me share my screen and just show you how to follow that document. This is the one thing that's a little bit tricky. All right. Hopefully you can see it now. So if you go down, that step one was to find what your piano has, whether it's MIDI in or MIDI out. What if you have both? I actually recommend using the B port because you can't get them backwards. And the MIDI in and out, you could do it backwards. Um, the cable, I actually recommend instead of getting something like this one where it has a USB B to USB A, I recommend this um, this double one. Whether you have MIDI in and MIDI out, you can do this USB C and A. So it has one cable that fits both new computers with USB C or iPads with USB C and USB A, which is older older laptops. Or if you wanted this cable here it has both the USB-C and A. So really, really handy. I've stopped getting just these single cables because you never know what a student's gonna have. Um, and it also cuts down on on having one of these, like a, a dongle or an adapter that you have floating around that could get misplaced. However, if you're, if you're trying to get connected to this, um, like an iPad, then a couple of ways I do it. I've tried this one and it works really well um, because you can plug in your headphone jack into your piano and run your sound through the piano. Uh, that is so that you can you can use headphones in your lab and hear both your computer and the piano. Uh, however, this one tended to fall out. So I have since started recommending this one instead. And 
this one's nice because it's just a dongle that you plug in and it it doesn't fall out. Uh, it looks a little bigger, so it doesn't look as nice, but I like it better. Here's a dongle that has a camera adapter and has your headphone jack and your USB for your piano. If you need one, I would carry this and maybe get two or three of these in your classroom. So if some one of the students needs it, you can just go grab it out of the box and just use it for that one. Um, if you have your setup and you're setting up iPads and you're buying them for your students and they just come in, then just have this one set up all the time because you can have your power plugged in, your headphones plugged in, and your piano plugged in, and you never drain a battery on an iPad. Um, that This is just a simple one, but it doesn't have the power connector and it doesn't have the headphone jack. Um, additional videos on installation I have here, but then connecting the audio setup, it's really important that you take a look at this. Your piano could have one of three options here. So if you look, there's a, there's a video tutorial that walks you through how to find these, but you're going to see either an input with an eighth inch jack or 3.5 millimeter and there's a cable here. You can just go to Amazon and grab that cable if that's what you need. However, if yours has a larger one with like an L and an R, then you'll want this cable, which you can get from there. And then the small end goes into your iPad or your computer. And then these go into your piano. This one here, if it has an L slash mono, what that means is it's stereo. And if you just want this one cable, you can get this thing here, and I have a link to it, and you just plug this into your mono and this one into your computer, and that would do both both ears, the right and left tracks. Um, sometimes you'll find an RCA input, in which case you would need RCA cable, and you could just use this cable that I've tested. Um, what if your piano doesn't have auxiliary input, then I'm really sorry for you, but there is a solution. If you're buying pianos for your lab, make sure that they have auxiliary input or the audio input. Uh, if you don't, and you just want a quick solution, you can use a Belkin Rock, Rockstar here as a hub. You would plug in your piano to it, your iPad, and your headphones. Um, and that would solve your your solution for hearing both the piano and the computer. Um, and there's some other things you can find in here that are helpful, like adapters. What kind of, uh, if you need an adapter for a quarter inch to an eighth inch one and such. Um, here's a, re a really cool gym. I call this the magic box. And if you are getting any sort of buzzing in your headphones, when in your audio setup, this will eliminate all the buzzing and all the audio um, sound. It's a group loop isolator. It's magic box. I don't know what it does. I just plug it in and it works. And it's worked on every piano that I've ever had uh, some feedback on. So hopefully that would help you get started. I recommend before you do the rest of your lab, just get one cable, test it, make sure you get the setup. It's easier than it looks. Buy the cable, try it out, and then get started. Next on the list is uploading your own content. If you forget anything or you need really detailed information, you can open this link and there's an awesome document here. Uploading and sharing your own files. The things that it covers are things like uploading and sharing your files with students, slicing your music, uh, how to make your own collection, how to use XML files and MIDI files, where to find them, how to convert them from photos, how to pay somebody else to do it, how to make your own XML files or making thumbnails. You can click on any of these and it'll, it'll go to that part in the document. There are videos that show, show you how to do it, um, how to share it with your classes. So you can share it with your class or with an individual. Um, how to slice it into learning segments if you want for your students how to upload videos and PDFs and put those in there. So really, really good document. I won't get into that. That's just for your resource when you need it. I instead will show you how easy this is right now. So let's go to Piano Marvel. The first thing you'll do when you get into the dashboard 
is you'll want to go to the library because that's where everything lives. Go to the library, click on this little upload button, and you're going to see a lot of stuff here that I have uploaded personally. Um, there's two sections, my uploads. You can see I've done a bunch. There's a little search thing if you're looking for, well, it's like a scale or something. You can see how it'll uh, search for that scale. However, if you're wanting to create a bundle, um, and let me give you an, a couple of examples of people that have done that. The Alfred Group Piano is here in Piano Marvel. And if you click on this, it will show you everything in that book. But a lot of people want to customize it. What's cool about this is you can you can see all of your students and how many of the songs they've done and also which songs they haven't done. So if I come over here to like unit four, you can see I've done this one. I've started this one, but there's four exercises in here too. I've done 33%. Um, so you can just see your students' grades without a problem. However, what happens when you don't want them to do certain songs or you want to borrow songs from other books or upload your own music? Um, then you're having to tell your students, oh, skip this one and skip this one, skip this one. So instead, what you want is absolute control over what your students see. And the way you do that is, uh, let me show you what uh, BYU has done. BYU actually entered their own, uh, here's, here's one of their courses, 113. And you can see they named their first chapter one, and they just have two assignments in there. Chapter two, they've got a bunch of assignments, reading intervals, time signatures. They do harmonization, sight reading. Um, and they've just, they've just uh, created their own curriculum. And they've created their own reports. So as the students go through it, they can see what's next. And they just have to, like, I can see I missed an assignment here. And I've got an 89% to improve that. I just have to go into that assignment and finish it. And then that shows up in my teacher's grade book. Um, now, there's another university, USU. They did something really unique. They're using the Alfred book, but they wanted to put their own thumbnail on it. And they put their names on it. They called their chapters modules. You can call it whatever you want. But what they did was they just dragged the page number from the Alfred book that they wanted. How did they do this? Let's go over and show you how to do that. Remember when you're over here, there is a create a new bundle and a book. So you'll want to first create your book. And let's create this book and let's call it, um, I'm going to do University of uh, My Own, UMO. And it's going to be, I'll just put various on the composers. Uh, or I could even put Alfred, whatever you want to put here. Um, you do have to choose a genre. And so oftentimes you'll just put something like methods or classical or whatever it is. And then you can put in a PDF for students. You can put in videos. You can create your thumbnails. What you definitely want to do is do the progress report. And I would do this um, just the same title and then click save. And then there's, of course, a share button. If, if you have so many of them, you don't know how to find it, you can do a search UMO. Oops, UMO. And there's my book. It doesn't have anything inside of it. So now what I have to do is create the chapters. And those are called bundles. So you click on a bundle. And I'm just going to say chapter one. You can call it whatever you want. And I'll put various on this. And the book you can choose, I'm going to put UMO and the genre is going to be methods. And this one, I don't need a thumbnail. I don't want to re progress report on individual chapters because I just want it in the one book. So I'm just going to continue here and hit save. So now when you click on this triangle, whoops, let me refresh this and see. Uh, let's see, UMO. I should see. 
Oh, something went wrong. I'm not sure. I think I called that chapter one. There it is. Okay. So we've got this chapter one here. I can duplicate this and put it in a chapter two. This little button right here is a duplicate. Let's say make a copy. Click OK. And you can edit this. You can remove it. Um, I'm going to click edit and rename this to chapter two. And make sure you've got this selected here and save. All right. So you can see now. The easiest way to do this, once you build these, it's going to be super easy to populate it. What do you populate it with? You can either use your own uploads, which you can click on this, upload a new song, which you'd need a MIDI file and an XML for. But we're not going to do that. Instead, we're just going to borrow songs that are from the Alfred Group Piano. So you click on the Piano Marvel Library, and you say Group Piano for Adults. And you can grab either book one or book two. And you can say, you know what? I want to skip all the way down to page 25. It's my favorite. And you just drop that one in there. And I want to do 26. And I want to do uh, something from the next chapter. Or that's all I want to do on that one. You can go back, grab another chapter. Let's say I like this one. Drop that in there. And then this one in there. You can do even do this. This is really cool. If you go to Sasser songs only, and you say, I want to just select something from like a level three sight reading, 3A to maybe 3E. So just a level 3E song. And you're not sure if this is a really good one, Arabia or Ali song. I'll take a look at it with this little eyeball. And you say, is this the one I want? And you say, yes, this is a perfect song for my sight reading. So I'm going to drag that one in. Um, it's really, really cool. Um, this little eyeball I love. You can actually duplicate some of these songs and you can edit them. Um, I won't get into that, but you can experiment with that. But you can see now I've got my UMO book done. Um, and I can go into here and just search for UMO. And you can see that it doesn't have a thumbnail because we didn't put one on. You can put it in your favorites. And if you do put it in your favorites, it'll live right here. So it makes it really easy to find. And I'd have your students do that. <clears throat> um, but you can see the chapters that I put in and the, the exercises that I put in. You can even see the report that's all automated. And since I've already played these songs, um, you, except for this one, I got a bad score on. I'd have to go and do it again to improve my grade. But you as a teacher can then see your entire class listed here and then over here. Now, you, you can see that this is my personal report. You as a teacher, instead, you will find it over here in my reports. And you will do UMO. And then this will show all of your students. You can sort by class. You can limit or filter your search. If I wanted to say, I'm just looking for my beginners. And then, and you've labeled your classes as begin, then just your beginners would show up. And you can see the students that have passed off some of these songs and the rest that have not. Um, so, so doing grading on these, makes it super, super easy. This just populates automatically. You never have to grade anything. If you want to get rid of one of those songs, you just go back into the uploads and you say, you know what? I don't like this one. I want to replace it with another one. It's that easy. You just get rid of it and you replace it, drag in another one in its place. And that's how easy it is to build. Now, if you wanted to create a thumbnail, um, there is this help button that will open up this thing and you could just do a search for thumbnail and say, well, how do I make a thumbnail? And if you'd like to make thumbnails yourself, it tells you we need a PNG.
thumbnail size this needs to be 300 by 330. Um, I personally like if I I like coming on to like my university's um, website. So let's say you're going to Texas A&M and you want to look for the logo. You can just usually find images and you can uh, just right click on this and say, save image as, and you need to do it as a PNG. So I might have to, change that a lot of times what i'll do is i'll just copy this thing right here um and then that's this is my copy tool you can do this on mac or the snipping tool in windows you just make a quick copy i'll just save it as a png and i'll just say my logo or whatever you want to call it how fast can I get it in? I'll just drop it on the desktop so I know how to find it. And then when you're in this, uh, the uploads, you remember there was this edit button where it asked you if you wanted a thumbnail. You just click on browse, go to my desktop, and I'll say my logo PNG, open it, and save. And that's all you do to create a cool little looking thumbnail. If I go back to my where Piano Marble was, in my library um, and you can see my favorites had that it now has a logo for your students and they can easily find that how do you share it with students that is a great question um, it is very easy over here there's a share button so if you click on share then you come over here to you can show this with all of my students or you can share it with just a specific class that you've set up or you can just set send it to a person's email address their piano marble um and then that would be just specifically that one person can then see it and you can of course remove access for them if you wanted to do this as like a test you could remove access let's see my beginner class i want them to have access to it i just click on save and then that will give them, I won't do that because then they, they get a message when they log in that I've shared this with them. Um, but it's super easy to just uh, share that with your students. That assumes that you know how to set up your classes. Um, let me show you really quickly how to do that. It's so easy. You just go in here and you can see a list of your students and you go to my class and you just create a new class and you name it you have an abbreviation name and you click save and then you will see your class populate over here and your list of students then will be over here and you can assign them into a class this way beginning and now that student is in the beginning class um, there's another way to do this on the student side um, of course this also assumes that you know how to link your account to your students um that brings us to day one what do you do in class to get started um day one in a class here's what i do i'm going to log out and show you what a student should do to create their account and to link them to you as a teacher so you have access to all their reports so day one we say create a free account and you can put this on the board i'm going to put an example and example for the last name i'll just do smith so it's easier to see and then i'm going to say example at smith.com and i'm going to create a password um if you're at a university make sure that your students do click on this have a referral and then they can put in the student discount code which is student um and then they click create an account and then it's done. The, the next thing they need to do is link to you as a teacher. So they can do that in two ways. And you can just walk through this with them that first day of class. I'm learning piano on my own or I'm learning with a teacher. I would say I'm learning piano with a teacher and then you can easily just type in your teacher's email address. If it's wrong, I don't know what it does actually. 
And hit submit. Okay, so it says this does not exist. If they type it right, then it just linked to me. Now they have where they can activate their account right away, or they can just continue with the free trial. Just a warning, if you're using the Alfred content, they won't be able to access until they upgrade to a premium. So they can just click on this upgrade to a premium and they can do this monthly one or the annual one. Or if they buy a subscription code from the bookstore, they would just put in the subscription code here and then they're set. Um, this popped open in a new tab. I'll just close that one and I'll say continue with the free account for now. Um, if you want to set up your teacher to a, or your student to the teacher and they miss that other step, you can always go into my account here, upgrade here, or preferences or my teacher here. It'll open up a new tab. You go to my teacher and you click edit, and then you type your teacher's email address. Um, and then you can also see if you've set up classes, your students can choose which class to put in here. Um, so that's another way that students can link to use a teacher and choose their class without having you do that for them. Um, and then what do you do on this one? The first thing that I have them do before jumping straight into a sight reading test, I will, on the very first day, I just have them open up the method, go to 1A, and I have them going through these things. First, I show them that there's a video that they can watch. I show them if you click on a note, I show them that you can hit this next button to go to the next song, that you can increase the tempo. I show them shortcuts like if you hit the plus on your keyboard, the minus, they love it when you show them these little tricks because it saves them time. They can highlight things. They really like that one. Um, I'm practicing this practice button, show them how the practice button works and show them how the play button works. Then I just turn them loose and I say, you've got 10 to 15 minutes. So we'll see who can get the furthest and just turn them loose and you walk around the classroom. Or um, another thing that, that is extremely helpful is first you open up this report called group practice minutes. And I'll tell you why you want to do this. Whoops, I'm in the example. I got to go back to my teacher account. Okay, logging back in. I'm going to use my saved login. Um, so go to my reports. And why would you want to show this report? This is really important. Go to my group practice minutes report. And what this does is it tracks practice minutes for all of your students. And you can choose what class you want to show. So if I'm in my beginning class here, I just click on go. And then just my students in this class will show up here. And if you want to change the date here, you can also do that. So it's the 23rd. I'm not wanting to see anything before that. And I'll just hit go. So now you can see as your students practice, their minutes will start to populate. And this helps you in a big way. First of all, if their name does not appear on this list, you need to, then you can go over to their station and help them link to you as the teacher. They didn't do something right and you know it right away. Then if they're showing zero minutes still, it means they did not practice today. And so you know something went wrong. But what you'll see is you'll start to see these populate down here with practice minutes. And then you'll find one student has nothing. And you'll say, all right, I need to go help Lydia. And you run over to Lydia's station and say, Lydia, what's going on? She's like, oh, it's not giving me a score or I can't find the right place. And then you can help Lydia while everyone else is working very effectively. Um, and then when you have your whole class set up, at that point, I usually take them over to the Sasser. When you go to the Sasser, instruct them to click on start test. They already know how the thing works because they've done it in the method already. Now you have to decide which one to give them. I do not give them the beginner one, almost, almost never, even for beginner students, because you never know if they know more than you think they do. So I always start them with intermediate. And the reason why, notice this went to 600. Um, 
that actually won't go to 600. It's an intelligent test because my last score was 949. It started me three levels below my last score. So since I, you can see how normally it would start at level two, but because my score was 949 last time, it's starting me three levels below that. So that's one thing you should know about it. The other thing you should know is beginners start at level 1A and go to 1B, 1C, 1D, very, very, very slow. Um, if you read music at all, you do not want to be in this beginner sight reading test because it goes so slow. Intermediate, advanced, and professional, they will start at level two here, but then move up very quickly depending on how well you read it. Same thing with advanced. It'll start at level seven and then advance you very quickly. And then the professional will start at level 13, advance you very quickly if you get 100% and moves you up five sub-levels. Um, so always start with intermediate. If they fail that a couple times, then you can tell them go to beginner. That's just a trick that I've learned. You might want to, if you want to try starting them in beginner and see what happens. That's fine. Experimentation is fun. That's just my uh, bit of advice. All right. Um, now, the other thing I do was once my students start taking the Sasser, I come over to my reports and I click on this, um, my group Sasser report, and I have this report open while they're taking the test. Um, you can do the same type of thing if I just want to see my beginner class. I click on go. And if you see that the students don't have any, uh, I should probably go to that day. They don't have a test score, then you will know that something went wrong. Um, but you'll start to see every when they start the test, their scores will populate automatically. And so you'll see who's reading how well. And I like to sit in front of the computer and just kind of observe this first. And then I'll walk around the classroom to see if I can help whoever's struggling. And I can see that from, from the report. You can see your whole class, how they're doing. All right. I know there was a lot that I covered. Um, I think that covers everything that I was going to go into. Um, David, was there anything I missed? Oh, cost. What is the cost? Let's go back to this one here. How do I get out of this? Hey, I want to show you now. We already did that. Customized curriculum. We did that. Uh, cable setup. We've already covered that. And it has a the uploading your own content we've covered. Oh, syllabus. I've included a sample syllabus for you in that document as well, in your notes, if you want to take a look at that. Um, the cost, here is the cost for you. Uh, if the most popular way that universities do this is super easy, they just have their students set up their own account and then they will just pay for it with a credit card online. They have 30 days where they can use like uh, a lot of the content, including the Sasser and the method. You can't use the Alfred until you actually subscribe. So some universities will say, I'm gonna use that first month for free and you've got a month to put in your credit card and then it's 15 bucks. So the whole course then would be uh, for that first semester would just be $45 with three months and you get your, your uh, first month free. If you needed to right away get the Alfreds, then it's probably gonna, then it'll cost you about 60 there. Or at the university bookstore, if you want to um, send an email to contact us at pianomarvel.com, you can order those for your bookstore. And you can either do semester accounts or annual accounts. And this is the student pricing. Um, group pricing is something that is a lot more rare universities don't often do this because they don't want to deal with the money but you can get group, group discounts if you have 50 students um it, the price is five dollars per month per student so the university actually does get a pretty big discount if you want to deal with with the with the finances which most universities don't want to deal with that so they just go with this easiest route or they put it in their bookstore 
One thing to consider is some bookstores by law have to put it in the bookstore because some students have financial aid that they can only use through the bookstore. So that's something that you might want to consider. Not all schools have that stipulation. So, and we are now to questions. Let's go ahead and stop. What did I miss? Who has any questions? Or was I pretty thorough? That seemed pretty thorough to me. Uh... Eggert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this webinar, will it be in uh, YouTube? You can see it again? Yes, we're going to record this and replay it on YouTube. And then I'll send out the link to it. Right, fine. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks for coming. You too. Bye-bye.